factor crosses today. I'm going to show you two different ways to do them. Uh, the way that is sort of represented in the PowerPoint is what I think is the more challenging way. So we're going to go through that. And then I'm going to show you the way that makes most sense to me and is how I always work through talking about. So we're going to try and do both of those things today. I'll finish up chapter five. Um, you should, at this point, be able to do, without lecture today, questions one through six on the homework. So after today, we should be able to do numbers seven through ten. I know everybody's working diligently on this. So. Um, <laughs> exam two is next Wednesday. And then it's fall break, so you'll take a super less stressful exam than last time. And then you'll go on fall break, and it'll be wonderful. Yes. We have our analytical exam the Wednesday after fall break. Are we on today? And a lab report the Tuesday after break. At least I get the exam done before break, so you can like not no, be watching I have two other exams that day, too. College is fun. All right, college is fun. Okay, um, anything else? No? We're good. Okay, so we left off on Friday looking at a three-factor cross. So this is called a three-factor cross because we are looking at three genes that are all linked on one chromosome. So Morgan is our first example because he picked three genes that were all linked together on the X chromosome. He knew that they were on the X chromosome, so knowing that he was able to establish what he expected to happen in the offspring, and then what actually did happen, and then he can start piecing together when crossing over occurred, in what frequency, how close the genes were together. So he had his three genes, which were body color, eye color, and wing length. He bred just over 2,000 fruit fly progeny, and he ended up with these distributions across phenotypes. So the first thing he can say is that Yes, these genes are linked on the X chromosome, but we do see recombination or crossing over occurring because we have progeny showing up that are not the parental phenotype, right? If these were linked on the X chromosome and there was no crossing over, every offspring would either be gray-bodied, red-eyed, long-winged, or yellow-bodied, white-eyed, miniature-winged. Okay. So the fact that we got anything else phenotypically means that we do get crossing over occurring across or between these genes. And so again, looking at this, we talked just quickly about it on Friday before we left, but we should be able to get a feel for which genes are closer together and which ones are further apart based on the number of offspring in each of these phenotypic classes. Right? So we have this zero and this one. That means that the gene that's the, the gene that is giving these two phenotypes, probably pretty close together. We don't get a lot of recombination there. Uh, 3, 17, and 401, further apart. Okay. So um, this is showing sort of one of the ways that we can start breaking apart this data and figuring out which, or figuring out distances between genes and in which order genes occur. So what I've done here is I've made two tables. Each of these tables represents two of the three genes. So the top one is body color and eye color. The bottom one is eye color and wing length. So I've taken every individual from the last slide that had a gray body and red eye, and I put them into one category. So gray body and red eye is here, gray body and red eye is here, and those are the only ones. So I added these together to create this category. Okay. So when you, if you do it this way, and again, this is one way that you can approach it, you would make, you'd actually end up with three of these tables. We'd have another table that would be uh, body color and wing length. And that would give you all three of the genes in two gene combinations. Um, and I think we've answered the question, why does the F2 have significantly different numbers of non-parental combinations? It's because our genes are linked. 
Um, and then, what's the quantity of difference between various concentrations? Okay. So, using this information, Morgan put forth his hypotheses. Again, we've already talked about. I'm now going to show you sort of a series of slides that shows what these crossing over events look like. <coughs> so we can kind of start seeing how distance between genes affects crossing over likelihood. Okay, so here on the top we have our F1 generation of each of these slides. Um, with no crossing over, this is what our F2 looks like. That makes sense to everybody, right? We've got three genes. Or here, sorry, we just have two genes, X and Y. So this would be body color and not X and Y, Y and W, body color and eye color. Right? We have one parent that is true breed, or uh, sorry, this is a uh, test cross. So we have one individual that's heterozygote and one individual that's homozygote. And in this case, we use a male because now they're really only contributing one chromosome. So it gets even easier to sort of follow that linking. All of the offspring, in this case, are parental. Over here, between the uh, body color and eye color genes, if we get crossing over between these two X chromosomes, now our offspring, we have a, a wild type eye, wild type body with a recessive eye, and a wild type eye with a recessive eye. And that in his cross is accounted for 17 and 12. So these genes are pretty close together. So we get kind of just a few of those offspring. When we look at the genes that are further apart, so we add in wing length, which is all the way down here. Um, again, the option for crossing over locations between now our eye color gene and our wing length gene are much greater. Okay, and they show a crossing over here, but it could be down here, it could be in the middle, it could be anywhere along there. That's why when we get crossing over between eye color and wing length, we get so many more individuals because that crossing over event is so much more likely to happen just given the distance. And then the least likely type of crossing over that we're going to get are double crossovers. So when we have double crossovers, we have to get crossovers between our body and eye color and between our eye color and our wing length genes. So this chromosome actually has to twist twice and give us this whole middle section gets replaced. Not over here where we have sort of top and bottom, top and bottom. We have top, middle, bottom. So the ends are the sort of original parental chromosome. The middle is the other homologous chromosome that gets sort of wedged in there. So that takes us back to here. On Friday, we also designated some of these um, uh, double crossovers, single crossovers, and parent parental, right? So top and bottom are parental. 401 and 317, I designated as single crossover one. 16 and 12, I designated a single crossover 2. And then 1 and 0 were the double crossover individuals, right? Okay. Um, so these two is this crossover. That 0 and 1 is this crossover. Event. These are less common than our sort of really distant crossovers. All right. So. We are going to do, get another chi-square, because I know that's how you want to start your Monday off. Um, so the proposal, again, that Morgan would have put forward is that eye color and body color, so we're just looking at two of these, are independently assorted. Assuming independent assortment, we would expect to have equal offspring phenotypically. So here would be your chi-square, or not your chi-square, your Punnett square. This looks a little bit different from what we've done because we are now dealing with a female who is heterozygote for two traits and a male who is homozygous recessive and only has one X chromosome. OK, 
Okay, so instead of having 16 blocks, we only have eight. So here we have our male. This is the only X chromosome that he can contribute, and then his Y chromosome. The female can make four different gametes. So her original is So she's heterozygous. In the past, we would have said, well, she can just give two X chromosomes, right? We would have said she can give this one, and she can give this one. But now we know that she can actually give four different versions of these same X chromosomes, because we can get crossing over between the, the mutant X chromosome and the normal X chromosome. So, we would get an individual that has wild type for body color and mutant for eye color. We can also get an individual that is mutant for body color and wild type for eye color. Okay, so now her gametes get a little bit more complex, which is why we have four of them. So in even this scenario, what do we expect the phenotypic ratio of the out of the offspring to be? Just looking at this kind of square. Yeah, we still get a one to one to one to one expected outcome if we think that our recombinant X chromosomes are going to be as common as our wild type. So if crossing over happened every time, we would still expect that to be a one to one to one. Okay, so just looking at these two traits, these are the offspring that we got. So when we took that eight phenotype, phenotypic class table and we pulled out all the gray body, red eyes, yellow body, white eyes, gray body, white eyes, and yellow body, red eyes, and added those numbers together, this is what we got. Do I have the chi-square in there for you or not? No, that's fantastic. Okay, so using this information and the information from the Punnett square on the last slide, let's well, just one to one to one to one. Just, just, just your whole analysis. All right, chi-square it up.
2,109.8, or close to, ish, mm -hmm. rounding. Okay, now, without having a chi-square table, I know that we can't for sure say that this is significant or not, but how, how, what is your gut instinct on this chi-square value? You know, we would probably end up rejecting this null hypothesis. This is in no way a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. And that is because not only are these genes linked, but they are very close together, which is why we only get 17 and 12 for recombinant offspring. So there's your math. Fantastic. Um, okay, so this is um, just an overview or sort of a summary of those three-point crosses. We're starting with one set of homologous chromosomes. Our options for offspring become single crossovers between A and B, single crossovers between B and C, or double crossovers, which are going to occur between A and B and B and C. And so in the offspring, we're gonna get a whole bunch of parentals because these outside chromosomes in this tetrad don't cross over. And then we'll get a bunch of non-parental chromosomes in the middle. Okay, so we are going to go through another example. Do I have this one in there? Um, okay, so this one I'm going to take us through in two different ways. I'm going to start with the way that makes sense to me. And again, there's kind of a learning curve on figuring this out. And then once you see it, it's like one of those things you can't unsee. All of a sudden, it just makes sense. Um, so I'm going to take you through it that way and hope that we can get to that point soon. Um, here we have fruit flies again favorite test subjects ever, right? We have, again, three genes. These look real similar to the last three genes. We have body color, eye color, and wings. So body color, we're either going to be black or gray flies. Eye color, we're going to be purple or red. And wings are either going to be vestigial or long. So vestigial wings are kind of small and they're crinkled. So these are basically non-flying fruit flies. They're so kind of grounded. Um, uh, these are going to be linked along chromosomes. Okay, so this is sort of their arrangement. Uh, here we have a female who is entirely recessive and a male who is entirely wild type. Okay, so gray is dominant to black, uh, red eye is dominant to purple eye, and long wings are dominant to vestigial wings. This is our parental cross. Now that we have an F1 individual, so at this point, hopefully we know that our F1 is going to appear a type entirely wild type. So this is the chromosome that this individual got from dad, who was entirely wild type, and the chromosome that this individual got from mom, who was entirely recessive. <coughs> so in order to get our, um, or in order to map our genes, we have to take this F1 individual and cross her with a recessive male, so this is going to be our test cross, we always start with a test cross. We always take an F1 individual and do a test cross. So hopefully at this point you know that your test cross individual is entirely recessive, your F1 individual is going to be heterozygous for each of our genes. Okay. okay, so from this cross we get an F2 generation that has eight phenotypic classes. <coughs> and allows us to test, or allows us to determine or map our genes. So the first thing we want to look at is, are these genes linked? So if these were unlinked, we would expect all phenotypic classes to occur in equal proportion. Do these appear to occur in equal proportion? No. no. So, you could do the chi-square for all eight of these uh, phenotypic classes, or we could go ahead and just trust me that these are linked on a chromosome. Um, I don't encourage you to trust me very often, but now is the time. Um, okay, so what is the next thing we can tell from this table? Yes, okay, so I'm going to rewrite this table a little bit differently. I'm going to write it as... So I'm going to rewrite the phenotypic classes, 
but I'm going to not do it with words. I'm going to do it with the um, genotypes. chromosomes that you're working with, like the parentals, you should be able to figure out the eight phenotypic classes. It's annoying, but it can be done. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to write is just the number of uh, observed offspring. Which one of these are our, are our parentals? Okay, so the top and the bottom, and they won't always be arranged like that, but in this case, we put the way that they do it is all wild type down to all recessive, and then you see sort of variants along the way, so that's why it's like that. So this would be a parental, and this down here would be a parental. What are our single crossover groups? Okay, so 61 and 60 will be, we'll call that single crossover one. The number associated with the number that I give it is arbitrary. You could call it single crossover 34 for all I care. We just need to know that it's, those two go together. Next. Okay, 30 and 28 will be our second single crossovers. And then one and two are double crossovers. Okay, now I know that you can see the chromosomes up here on the board, but in your homeworks and on the exam, I'm not gonna show you the chromosome. The first thing you're gonna have to determine is in what order do these genes fall on a chromosome, okay? So, the easiest way to do that, in my opinion, is by pulling out our double crossovers and lining them up. double crossover, and then our other double crossover would be this, right? Yes? If we can, if we take our double crossovers and we compare them to our parentals, we can figure out which gene is in the middle. So when we look at our parentals, our parentals were and all right, so what you have to do, and this is the part where it gets very confusing to people, including I have to like relearn this every time I teach it, is we have to look at which of these three genes stay in the same place related to each other between the double crossovers and the parentals. Okay, so let's just start with this first one. We're gonna look for the B plus, where the wild type B is here. PR plus is next. PR plus is not here. Okay, that's all right, so just keep that in mind. VG plus, VG plus. When we look at the next one, we have B, PR, not PR, wild type, and BG, BG. So, in this case, we know that the PR gene, or the, the gene for purple eyes, is in the middle, because if we flip these, we now have the parental chromosomes. 
So we have to figure out which gene switched in the double crossover. So when we flip it back, it would look like the parentals. That's always going to be the gene that's in the middle. Okay, so when I say, here's an F2, so let's see exactly how I word this. So on a homework, I would say from the data below, calculate the map, coefficients of, uh, coefficients of incidence and interference. We'll get to those. Um, Determine the order of the loci. The first thing you would do is pull out your double crossovers and your parentals, and you see which gene flipped to make your double crossovers. So you look at your parentals, you figure out which gene switched, and that gene is the one in the middle. So when you map this, PR would be in the middle, and then BG would be on one end, and B would be on the other, which we know we have because I showed it to you here, but you won't always get that. Okay, so we drew a map. The next thing we need to do is figure out the distance between B and PR, between PR and BG, and then between B and BG. Okay? Once you have the map, the rest of it's not too terrible. Okay, so to figure out the distance, we have to go back to those equations that I gave you last week. Which is what? Recumbent progeny? Huh? What? Sorry, I couldn't hear over your eraser. Is it the recumbent progeny over total progeny? Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, in order to determine our map distances between B and PR and PR and BG, we are going to find our number of recombinant offspring divided by the total number of offspring. So, for this, we're actually going to start by looking at our single crossovers. So which one do we want to find first? BR, B to PR or PR to BG? B to PR. B to PR. Okay. We will write it. Our distance from B to PR. Um, we have two single crossovers, or two single crossover pairs. One of those single crossovers occurs here. The other one occurs here. So now we have to figure out which single crossover is which. Best way to do this is to look at the parentals. Again, look at the single crossovers and figure out which gene switched. Okay, so if we're looking here to here, which gene looks different? Okay, so BG, so this one is going to be the distance from PR to BG. Once we know that, we know that the other member of single crossover 1 is also PR to BG. So for single crossover 2, B wild type PR and BG, the one that's different from one of our parentals is B, so we know that this is from B to PR, and our other is from B to PR. Okay, so once you have everything labeled, super easy piece. Okay, so now we're just ready to plug in numbers. We are going to take our number of recombinant offspring, which is how many for single crossover two? Okay, so we take 30 plus 28. We have to add in our double crossovers because they also cross over between B and PR. Yep, right? Yeah, so here's double crossover. B and PR also flipped. Okay? If we leave out the double crossovers, your distances will be too short. Okay. Uh, so then we add in, <coughs> excuse me, plus one, plus two. And then what's our total? It's up on there. Yeah. Okay. So our total would then be. Okay, 
Yeah, yeah? Yes. Okay. So then we multiply that by 100 to get math units. 6.1 math units. Okay. So to get from PR to VG, we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to use our other crossover. So we're going to take 61 plus 60. We have to add in our double crossovers because, again, they also cross over between those two genes. So plus 1 plus 2 over our total number of offspring gives us 124. Now you have half of a test problem done. <laughs> More than half, two thirds. <laughs> that was the saddest. <laughs> okay. So I would encourage you to do the do these problems this way. There are. I gave you three practice problems for this on your homework, okay, because repetition is good. Um, I do have additional test problems or example problems, so if you do three and you want to practice more before the exam, I can do that. I can give you problems. Um, but I can guarantee you right now that there will be a big question with It'll probably be 15% of it. 20% maybe, we'll see how I feel. Okay. But once you get it, you got it. Right. If you don't get it, if you're having trouble getting it, come see me. We'll go through a couple together. Okay? All right. Everybody okay? Ish. Maybe we're like still. Um, okay. So we talked about that. Uh, so in the slides, if you're going to do these, please tell me. Yes, please. No. 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 All right, I will post these. This is the alternative way to do it. And if this makes sense to you, great. It's the same math. It ends up being the same thing. But this requires you to take this table of data and pull apart the separate tables. I find that there's more steps to get lost if you do this. Um, but so the other way that you can do it is you can take two genes at a time and figure out what's going on. So here we've taken body and eye color. We've added together everyone that is gray-bodied and red-eyed. So these are our wild types. 
would be here and here. So we add these numbers together and we get part of the total. Uh, and then we do these two to get our other half. Those are our parentals. They're parental in that they have the parental phenotypes for body and eye color. Non-recombinants then, or the non-parentals or recombinants, would be our other groups. So it would be anybody who is gray-bodied and purple-eyed, so wild-type and recessive, these two. And then uh, black-bodied and red-eyed, so these two. Okay. Using that information, now we have our value of 61, which we have up there. There we see it. That's our body to eye color number. So you would take your recombinant category and you do 61 over 1,000, or 1,005, and you would get this now. Okay. So this just takes an extra step to get here. Here would be your tables for gray body and wing. Okay, and again, we would take wild type and wild type, so this category and this category, and that's your 413. We take this category and this category, that's your other 413. Non-parentals become this guy and this guy for 91, and then this guy and this guy for 88. Okay, and again, 179, actually this is the one that we didn't do, is the, the bottom one. This one becomes concerning to me because it doesn't account for double recombinants, and now the distance between B and BG is wrong. Okay, so this one you have to be careful with because we have to add in these numbers again to get the actual correct number. So if you're going to do this, you need to make sure you know that this needs to double the double crossovers. Okay, and then this is uh, the PR and BG category where we're looking at these two. So this one and this one would go together to give us 439. This one and this one would go together to give us 442. And then whichever one they didn't point to now, let's see how it goes. Okay. How many people think that this makes more sense? And how many people think that this is? Is it only because I described this one in more detail? Okay, so I'm going to leave, I can post these slides if people want to sort of explore both options. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time getting into this because I think that two ways is more confusing than one way. But I do present it, or it is here in case somebody's really struggling here. Um, okay, so then you construct your map, yada yada. The last piece of this, and this will be the last part of this chapter, um, is calculating what we call the coincidence of inter... Uh, Coincidence and interference. Um, these are values that we need to include because uh, between or when we have double crossovers, sometimes when a chromosome crosses over once, it becomes less likely to cross over a second time. So the first crossover reduces the likelihood of a second crossover, and so we call that interference. Right, because one crossover interferes with another crossover. To calculate how much interference is occurring, we multiply single crossover rates or frequencies from BR, B to PR and then from PR to BG. So we take our frequency of recombination right here. 0 0.061, we no, multiply that times 0 0.123, just stuff like that right now. Expect 
expected rate of double crossovers, if we want to now figure out how many double crossovers we should get in this situation, we take our total number of offspring and we multiply it by our expected rate of double crossovers and we should get about 7.5 recombinant or double crossover individuals. Okay, so how many double crossover individuals did we actually get? Three. We expect 7.5. Because there's such a difference in these numbers, we now expect that there is interference because 7.5 does not equal 3. All right, so something is going on. One of these crossovers occurring is preventing the other crossover from occurring. Okay, so because we have fewer than expected, we call this positive interference. If we had more so if we ended up with 30 double crossover individuals, that would be negative interference because that would mean that one crossover is actually creating incentive for a second crossover to occur. That's fairly rare. I don't expect that you'd end up with any negative values or negative interference. We can calculate the actual interference number. And I already have a math up here. Um, so interference itself is 1 minus C, where C is the coefficient of coincidence. C is calculated as observed over expected, right? So we have three observed double crossovers over 7.5 expected, what we just calculated. So our coincidence of, uh, coefficient of coincidence is 0.4. I realize that the slide is really out of order. We plug in that 0.4 4 up here, 1 minus 0.4, 4, 6.6, 6, or 60% interference. We have 60% fewer double crossover individuals than we would expect. That's what this is telling you. 60% fewer double crossovers than we would expect. So we have to calculate the number we would have, the number of double crossovers we expect and then see the proportion that we actually got. So we actually got 3 out of 7.5 or 60%. Okay. So on your homework problems, again, I'm just going to keep saying this. You're going to first map it, so figure out the order of the genes. <coughs> Second, you're going to calculate the distances, which we did on that board. Third, you're going to give me your coefficient of coincidence and your interference values. Practice that and you'll probably get at least 20% on the next exam. Oh, Yay! Okay, so uh, these last few slides are just showing like how we actually use this. We're talking about it as like three genes at a time. But this is the human genome. This is actually a really cool website. If you go to this website, you can like sort of click on or hover over each of these little dots. This is the human genome. These are the genes that are associated with different diseases or conditions. Okay, so we have mapped the human genome in a much more technology savvy way than this. Nobody sat there and calculated these values for every single one of these. But this is a really cool thing that's really important in medicine right now. Um, we do the same thing, this is in Drosophila, we do not different things. But it's really, really important for a whole lot of reasons. Okay. So when we come back on Wednesday, we will um, start in Chapter 6, which is kind of a complete left turn from here, but interesting nonetheless. On Friday, if we have time, I'll give some um, class time to go through worksheet problems. If everybody's struggling with one or two of the worksheet questions, we can go over those as well. Yes, I posted a lot of
Kentucky Myers is showing us like this all Not yet. Yeah, they're in here. Oh, I don't